experiment, uh, the connection uh, group usually sponsors luncheons at every at the second uh, Thursday of each month. But this is an experiment. We're going to try trying a breakfast, number one, to see if people can actually get up in the morning. And secondly, to, to try to have both uh, a social and an academic function within one event. We've never tried that before you see how it works. So we hope you'll learn something from this. And the long-term purpose of this is to get more people involved in trying to preserve our history. And uh, we're, we're not ashamed to, to say that right up front. That's the reason we're all doing this. Um, I have make some acknowledgments. I would like to acknowledge Ed and the Connection Crowd for hosting this. And I would encourage folks that are here from out of town, don't get back to Chattanooga that often. Try to schedule your, your future vacations around that second Thursday of the month so you can attend a regular connection function and you can, I guarantee you won't be disappointed. Uh, there are other people that are not here today that I'd like to acknowledge. Bob Johnson, Class of 65, operates our Central History website. Uh, I encourage you to go there because all of the basis for this presentation comes from material we've already posted on the line. But this is the first attempt to put it together into a story. Um, Melinda Martin, the current librarian and media specialist at Central, couldn't be here this morning. We'll, she'll be at our reunion tonight. And uh, Melinda is making a noble attempt to archive all of the materials that were left up from the old school. And I would say that right now. Anybody that's here and has nothing to do before our reunion this evening and the connection crowd, we're going to be at the school at 3.30 this afternoon getting ready, and we'll be glad to give uh, a quick tour of what we have there. It's, it's really uh, amazing all the materials that got stuffed away in drawers and has been sitting there 44, 45 years waiting for us to, to bring it back out, dust it off, and present it. Um, Buffy, who's trying to hide from me now, Buffy Ho, class of 74, has been our ground troops. She's been going to the Chattanooga Library and she's working with the the Central Library to, to resurrect all of this stuff. And you'll see some material today that Buffy has found for us that uh, adds immeasurably to what we're trying to present. Uh, with that in mind, I'll go right to the title slide, Under the Rotunda. The reason I chose that as the, to kick off the presentation was when I went to Central, I always felt like the Rotunda was the pulse of the school. That was the land of a thousand conversations. You, you found out what was going on and what was about to go on and what had gone on under the Rotunda. That was our Facebook. That's right. <laughs> and I, I'll say this, I'll say this un, unashamedly right now. If someone asked me if I could go back in time to a happy place, this would be my first choice. And as soon as my cohort gets back up there to give it out her party favorites, we'll get going. Hit the second slide. Oh, can I do that? Sure. What if I hit the wrong button and it ejects? <laughs> Which button am I looking at here? The goose button enter? right here. The, ah! <laughs> I hit enter. What happened? Uh, these are the events that led directly to Central, but I want to pause here. This is like the, one of those late night TV shows. But wait, there's more. Uh, the events leading to Central. It, uh, a wise person named Ed once told me you'd be hard to present the history of Central without talking about the history of Chattanooga. And I want to do that right now. These are the direct events, but the irony is the first Central would have probably been located in Harrison if history had played out properly. And I'll explain. If you go back to uh, the word eminent domain that we all heard about in high school in history, uh, eminent domain led the Cherokee to just willingly give up their land and give it to the white people back in 1838. And when that happened, Hamilton County then had new land south of the Tennessee River in which to, to, to play and explore. And while we think it was that was what the beginnings of Chattanooga, actually, is the beginnings of Harrison. Harrison was the first community south of the river that was formed. The, the people in Dallas, the old county seat across the river where Chester Park, Park, Cross Park is, bought, bought up all the land. It's a Joseph Van Plantation at the mouth of, of the creek coming in there, uh, the one we call Wolf Teaver today. And uh, it was a nice flat area, a beautifully groomed. The uh, chief band of the Cherokees had, <coughs> had a bunch of slaves, had horse tracks, raised, raised horses. It was a beautiful area. They bought that up and sold it, sold like hotcakes. They renamed the place Harrison after the city president, uh, William Henry Harrison. And Harrison, Tennessee was the first thriving community south of the river. And were it not for a strange turn of events, that would still be in Kansas City. But what happened was they got greedy and sold all the land. And there wasn't a flat place left. 
when the railroads decided to come in, and if you draw, if you just look at the map of the United States and look at the major ports, Savannah, Charleston, New Orleans, and the end of Port St. Louis, and the manufactured northeast, and you show where they crossed, they crossed right about here. That was right for the railroads to take over and become the way to deliver goods. So Chattanooga was, the area was destined to be the railroad crossroads. And so when the Western Atlantic, the state of Georgia, decided to put a railroad line to the Tennessee River, they started looking for routes in. Harrison was completely saturated. They were going to have to buy some land. Chattanooga, which basically was a mud hole in the 1840s, and nobody wanted to go there, had plenty of land, and they gave the land to the state of Georgia to, to locate a terminal. So the railroads came to Chattanooga rather than Harrison. That was Harrison's death nail right there. Because then the railroad came in from St. Louis in 1854, the railroad from Knoxville came in in 1858, and Chattanooga all of a sudden became the hub. And the Civil War, you hear, anybody ever heard about the Battle of Harrison in the Civil War? It was already forgotten. Chattanooga was, was the place for the Union Army to, to locate. The Union Army generals came here after the war and started the manufacturing industry. The people moved in. Then we had the second land rush. The second land rush consisted, there's no place to go west or north had to go east. So the last second land rush was East Chattanooga Land Company, Highland Park Land Company, and Mission Ridge Land Company. Bought up all the land and started building homes for people. The Highland Park Land Company, which we'll talk about in a minute, was the leader. They actually started their own electric railway. They built a viaduct across Macaulay Avenue to get across those gritty railroad tracks, and that opened up all the land in Ridgedale and Highland Park for, for people to locate, and that became the boom areas. Uh, had it not been for that turn of events, the first, when they started st started thinking of county schools, the first schools would have been in Harrison, rather than Chattanooga. So I think it's ironic that we should have been in Harrison, we were in Chattanooga, but we ended up in Harrison after all. So fate has a funny way of working. Now we'll get into the presentation. We've got a lot, lot to cover in a short amount of time. Uh, for a long time, the only high schools in Tennessee were in the cities. If you grew up in the county or rural areas, you had, you had to go to private school. And there was hardly any way a family could, get, could release one of the prime workers and actually pay them to send them to school. So it wasn't happening. So the General Assembly decided they better get the county school systems on board. So they authorized them to collect taxes and issue bonds to start the school system. Well, Hamilton County jumped all over that. And 17 years later, they decided to go to high school. Um, but in the meantime, the school the Chattanooga Electric Street Railway, which was a subsidiary of the Highland Park Land Company, had made their main junction, the Ridge Junction, on Dodds and Chamberlain Avenue, so the stage was set. Uh, the west side of Dodds was called Electric Park. It was a park where the first Labor Day celebration was held, and it was a big thing, except that it, people just weren't coming out to the park. It was too far out of town. So they built a, another park called Olympic Park, which we now know as Warner Park built a racetrack where people could bet on the horses, Electric Park sort of disappeared. And that land became available in the early 1900s. So in 1905, Chamberlain Avenue Land Company divided it up into lots and offered it for sale. About the same time, a year later, the courts authorized bond issues for high school construction. So now we have the stage set for the next slide. Here's a map of the electric railway system, and now that's hard to see for you old folks like me, but that's downtown upper left, and on the right, you see that well, there's a junction there. That was called Ridge Junction, and Electric Park was that little rectangle across from Ridge Junction. That was what became available. This is the only picture we can find of Electric Park. That is not Macaulay Lake. Electric Park had about six or seven small lakes. I think you can see the railway going up on going up to Missionary Ridge, uh, on Missionary Ridge. It actually ran along the top of Missionary Ridge back then, but right behind this. This is one of the lakes that were probably filled in and became part of the colony. Here's the beginning. Started right at the first the first meeting in 1907. The board proposed issuing bonds. Had to get the money. In February, they basically took offers for where, where they should locate it. And the vote was four to three to go to Ridgedale. Three people living north of the river wanted it at the normal Chattanooga Normal University, which is now Normal Park School. And four, three people wanted it in Ridgedale. And the superintendent of the board said, well, Ridgedale made more sense because it was closer to the center of population. And the students wouldn't have to, both the students would have to cross the river, but there's only one place to cross, the Martin Street Bridge. 
to get to school. And so they selected Ridgedale by vote of 43. Uh, construction contract was issued that May. It wasn't time to get the school ready for opening. Uh, so they started hiring faculty. They immediately hired the principal, uh, principal Mara from the Union City School System. And he was the only one interviewed. He highly recommended. They just hired him on the spot. They selected five faculty in June. And I'll go over those for you in just a future slide. Uh, the school opened at the old Ridgedale School on September the 6th, and I think they said something on the order of 140 in row. Uh, by the end of the year, there was over 220 students there. Um, the old Ridgedale School had been closed the year before for the new Ridgedale Grammar School, so it was available. So they made it an unheated, unelectrified building for the first three months of their four months of their existence. Um, they, here, here's what's in, probably shouldn't surprise you. Two weeks after school opened, they had a football team. Now, the county board had not authorized any funds for football, but the principal, Dara from Nashville, had been watching Battleground Academy and Montgomery Bell Academy have football teams for about 20 years, and he was impressed at how much that contributed to the school spirit. He was bound to determine. So the first faculty hire in Central Maine was the coach of the Battleground Academy football team. <laughs> he happened to teach Latin, and he happened to get the highest salary of anybody that was hired. <laughs> Just coincidental. Okay. The football team didn't do very well, though. They had nobody that ever played football to save one guy that had played for college that transferred over to Central to save a little money. Okay. They lost to Baylor 17-5, to and Baylor doesn't even have that on their record. They didn't have a football team in 1970. And City was the defending East Tennessee champions, and the year before it beat the University of Chattanooga. So they beat Central 63 to nothing. And that right there looks like, oh, that was terrible. Well, it actually caused some changes very quickly. Go to the next slide. Central's first football team, this is the only picture we have of the old Ridgedale School, partial, and that's the teams seated in front of it. And I hate to admit I can probably name everybody on that picture because I've been studying this so much. But back on the right rear is uh, Coach Walter K. Green. And I kept for, for years trying to figure out who he was. And I'll tell you about him in a minute. He didn't just, he went away, but he didn't go away. Next, yeah. This is right before the grand opening. They haven't even planted the grass seed yet, but they had to take the sidewalks in front of the school. Remember those big old trees out front? Well, they were not very big. <laughs> and that's all there was to the building at the time. Yeah. Next happening. January 3rd, 1908, we had a big shebang out there in front of the school and had the governor and the U.S. Commissioner of Education there giving speeches. And the following, that was on Friday, January 3rd. I was there, I remember it well. Uh, <laughs> January the 6th, the following Monday, they opened and they had added another 78 students from the junior highs into the new teaching program. So 8th graders actually came in as ninth graders and that put them over 300 students. With nine faculty, they added a faculty member to teach the teach the teachers in the department of pedagogy. The baseball team played in the city prep league and actually won some games. They beat McCauley three times and Baylor once in the first season. Uh, about the time they, they started winning, the coach announced that he was moving to a school in Knoxville, taking a position up there for a lot more money and was resigning. Uh, they graduated the first senior class of 19 in the junior second and it was not at the high school as all the history of the shooter team. And there go my glasses. Put it next this is the picture of the first baseball team, and this is taken at the new school. And that's still Coach Green sitting there in his hat, looking like he's already signed a contract. <laughs> Looks like he's ready to go. But I want to say these pictures were added at the last minute, and I'd like to stop right now. Pam Mullinax was with me when we found those in the library down there back in May. And Pam's a little handy dandy computer that takes pictures of the conference for these Thank you, Thank you Pam. These are a great discovery, really. There were no annuals for another four years, so it's hard to find any pictures of what happened the three or four years previous. Okay? Next picture. This is the first faculty. Now, this is going slow, guys. We're going to speed up, but I really think it's important because you won't find some of these people in any yearbooks or digests because they were gone by then. The very first person on the left was named uh, Otis Clifford Kirkman, O.C. Kirkman, electrical engineer, worked for the University of Tennessee, run their shops. He was hired to, to administer the first manual arts program in this area. 
and so Central was the first school to offer a dual uh, system of a classical education for college or an occupational uh, degree, if you will, through the manual arts department for, for the mechanics and the, the draftsmen and the electricians and all that were to, to, to go direct out of high school to work. Uh, the second lady, the, the first lady and the second person on top, that had to come from a family photo because we had no other pictures of her. Her grandson gave me that photo about a year ago. Her name was Mary Isabel Bill or Maybell. Uh, she was the granddaughter of the governor of Alabama from a very prominent family. And she married Kirkman at the, at the end of the first two years. She became Mrs. O.C. Kirkman, her second year central. She didn't have a third year because she happened to get pregnant that second year. And her daughter Lila was born right after school started in 1909. Her daughter Lila came back to teach at Central in the 30s as a history teacher. Then she got pregnant and then went back to school and taught at Piner for another 30 years. So all these people are very prominent in Chattanooga history. Now, Kirkland was at Central from 1916. He left to start up Tennessee Tech on the inaugural faculty there. Came back to start the manual arts department at city, the new city high school on 3rd Street, 1921. In 1928, he became the, the uh, principal of Chattanooga Vocation School, which we knew as Kirkman when we were there. Named after him upon his death in 1943. The third person, because her is, is Maybell's sister, um, Amanda Russell. Now, Amanda was probably the, the, the more pro the most prominent person here. She started the teaching program in this area. She was called the teacher's teacher. Uh, she was at Central longer than anybody on this picture from 1920 when she left to, to, to direct the Department of Instruction for the city school system, which she held until, until her death in 1935. And uh, all of the, the, the uh, fairs and uh, shows that were put on by the city of Chattanooga during the teens and twenties, she was responsible for. She was also responsible for starting up the little theater. Uh, so she was a very prominent person in the history of Chattanooga as well as Central. And again, she was the only person, I want to throw this in now. The early graduates of Central were also, a lot of them were graduates of City. City didn't have a teaching department. Central did. The students at City came over to Central and took classes in order to qualify as teachers that could get their certificate to work in Central. So they had dual, we had dual graduates for several years there. Before city opened their own department. Uh, Central offered a, four year, a fourth year of high school before City did. A lot of city students graduated from city, came to Central and got the real degree for, for a time before city caught up. That's how far ahead we were back then. The fourth guy is Walter K. Green, mystery man. I had to get that from the Battle Ground Academy uh, yearbook for 1906 when he was a coach and Latin teacher there. I wonder what became of him because they just, it was just W.K. Green and all of this stuff. I finally Googled and found out that he ended up getting a doctorate at Harvard, was the dean of students at Duke for 10 years, and was the president of Walford College his last ten years. The fourth guy was the only person that was a political appointment. He ran for superintendent against J.B. Brown in 1907, and they had a tie vote, and he conceded to Brown in order for him to get a teaching position at Central. He was a law student at UC, and that's a picture of him graduating in 1910 from law school. That's the only picture we have of him. And he was the guy that set up all the athletic schedules and the budget. And he made Central into a money-making enterprise. He's a, real, he's a real slick guy. That's right, he became a lawyer. Um, <laughs> the lady at the bottom was the first English teacher. She was responsible for starting the Digest in 1911. Her name is Nanny Carter. Uh, she died in 1916 while still on the faculty. Uh, she had five children and was widowed, and that probably contributed, and taught at Central. That probably contributed to her short lifetime. But uh, she was still in her early 50s when she died. But she had her, her mark is on Central in a lot of ways, including the Digest. The guy next to her was another lawyer, had a law degree, and he's working for the University of Chattanooga, and he came to Central to teach math because he wanted to teach math. He apparently was very good. He had won a, a he'd come in and placed in some national math competition. So it was a hobby of his, even though he's a lawyer. And he came to Central long enough to teach math and get started. Then he left in 1911 to start uh, East Tennessee Normal University, Normal School in East Tennessee State. He was the first registrar and math teacher in East Tennessee State. Uh, the next guy is also another distinguished figure. His last name was McGuff, first name Charles. His dad and uncle issued the McGuff Readers out of Tennessee for many years. He's a very prominent educator and lawyer. He was, he was, he was living in Knoxville, and I don't. I, the only reason he came to Chattanooga was he had a nasty divorce. His second wife 
and he had to move to Chattanooga with his third wife in order to, to exist, I guess, because his second wife was in Knoxville. We established a law practice here right at the yellow fever ep epidemic in 1878, and when the uh, city officials all moved to the mountains to go away from the yellow fever, he moved into City Hall and ran the city for a couple of years until it was safe to come back. He apparently was immune. Uh, he was the founder of Bonnie Oaks. Uh, he taught at Chattanooga Law School. And this is the thing, I, can never, I cannot find anywhere where Central ever hired him. He may have talked for nothing. He started corresponding with literary figures and generals around the world. He was a scholar. And he became very interested in the Spanish-American War and learned to speak Spanish. Taught himself Spanish. And he approached Central about teaching Spanish. There was no school in Tennessee offered Spanish. So he started teaching Spanish at Central when he was open, and I can't see that he's ever paid. He did what he did as a volunteer. Uh, the last person is George Davis, who was working on his chemistry degree at UC, but he had teaching credentials, and he was a local school principal. And he left, in, left uh, Central in 1916 to start up Middle Tennessee State. He was their first science and biology <coughs> visit, Middle Tennessee. So these are real prominent people, and they, while they didn't spend very long at Central, they started the ball rolling. I, and you won't find them in any annuals anywhere. I thought it was important to go over these. Now we'll, we'll speed it up a little bit. Now, now where's Miss Schwartz's picture? She was there. What's that again? Miss Schwartz. Miss Schwartz. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ms. Schwartz. Built, yeah. She comes in in 1910. Okay. But before her, Annie Mae Shelton comes in in 1990. She was there when we were freshmen, too. Yes. Yeah. That shows how old we are. Some of these people were around when we were there. <laughs> okay. Principal Dara was a son of Irish immigrants. Went to college, barely, graduated from college at age 17. Was teaching Latin and Greek at Beach Grove College outside Nashville when he took a job as principal of a school there. And within a few years was superintendent of schools in Union City. And that's what he was doing when Central hired him. He was a very ambitious guy and his ambition was his demise. We'll talk about him a little bit more. But he came to Central at its opening and brought his family with him. His daughter was in the first graduating class. And he was responsible for a lot of the things uh, that happened in Central the first five years. Most notably, Central's rise to prominence in sports at the expense of Macaulay, Baylor, and City. We'll I'll get into that in a minute. And that, that, that shortened his career considerably. But he, he, he bought his way in. His first job was when he got beat 63 to nothing, he went out and got a ringer. He got a, an All-American football player from Ohio Westman named Jimmy Wright. Uh, Wright wanted to coach college football, and UC hired him as their coach, but it wasn't a job. That was, UC was more of a club team. City had beaten them within the last two years. And so there was no salary of any consequence. He still needed a job. Dara offered him a job as, our, as a biology teacher and football coach. So he had his job at Central, and his hobby was coaching UC. An interesting way. But this, this was how Dara maneuvered to get, to get in. Well, Wright didn't know about being a gentleman who wasn't from the South. And so he started recruiting athletes from Baylor and Macaulay immediately. Boy, were they mad. And he got free education and you can play football, but you don't have to pay. And so he got the good athletes and I immediately Central started winning football games. It's amazing what a little powerful do for a coach. Uh, the highlight was November the 6th, they beat City 6 nothing. This is after being beat 6 to 3 nothing the year before. Uh, Totally different thing. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more now. But that was what started uh, Principal Dairy's downfall. He beat City his first, the first, the, the second year in, and that, that just wasn't done. City was the, was the 500 pound gorilla. The first basketball team wasn't very uh, great either, so he had to, Coach Rock had to do a little more recruiting. The second year team was undefeated. It's amazing the, the talent that, that they brought in. His first baseball team was undefeated. And then they graduated 35 from 19 to 35 that second year. Okay, so you can see now Central has become prominent. Uh, they've hired Coach Wright. He's got all the athletes in the area coming in. They replaced uh, Green with a Latin teacher named named Setliff, who uh, taught at Central till he was 85 years old. Retired in 1937. Uh, the next lady uh, I, is, is Mary Beck. And we'll get to, to Beck in a minute. The Beck family was a prominent North Chattanooga family. They basically were responsible for building down Mount Chattanooga from the rock quarries. Mary Beck was the, was the niece of the school board chairman. 
And while that sounded like she's a political hire, Principal Dare hired her for one reason. She knew how to play basketball. And they didn't have a girls basketball team. Her basketball team at Central were undefeated. The, uh, three, the four years she's at Central, they never lost a game. The fourth person was named Mabel Fair. Central decided to offer the first course in domestic science. We now call it home ec. They were the first school to offer a, a diploma with, with in home economics, domestic science. She was hired from UT to, uh, to start that program. She left after two years to start the program at Knoxville, Central, uh, Knoxville City High School, which is our alma mater. And uh, so that was another first for Central. Now we're the first one on the women's side of having a, having a basketball team and a domestic science. Uh, very quickly, the lady down number five, good looking lady that we knew as a little old lady, Annie Mae Sheldon. Uh, she came in at age, age 19, and she'd already been teaching a year. She graduated from college at age 17 also. And uh, she went back and got her master's degree while she was at Central early on. She was at Central 51 years, longer than any other teacher. Our historical society is still named after her. She belonged to every society in the book. She was from a prominent family in Middle Tennessee, the daughter of a doctor. And she married John Shelton, a local school principal, in 1912, invited the, senior, invited the entire school to their wedding. The announcement was made in the digest that she was getting married and they were invited to the wedding. Uh, number six, you may not have heard of her. She's a city graduate, uh, Harriet Grieve. The people that went to UT may know that there's a Green Hall up there, and she was the first uh, Dean of Women at UT in 1920. That's when she left Central, Dean of Women. She was Dean of Women for 31 years. Uh, seven and eight, people here have never heard about, but they were very prominent musicians of their day. They ran a music studio in downtown Chattanooga. Uh, Charles Garrett had been the director of music at a college in, called Bradford College in Ontario. Uh, one of his biggest fans was Alexander Graham Bell. He used to come and listen to his concerts. Uh, his wife died in Milwaukee. He came south for one reason. His oldest two sons were the first two band directors at UT. And he moved to south to live with them. Met this young lady over here about 30 years younger than him who was a prominent musician. She, she has oh, probably 30 or 40 songs copyrighted still in her name today. Uh, Julia. And they married in Knoxville, and I, I still haven't figured out how they moved to Chattanooga and set up the music business here. And uh, they were contracted to provide the music at all the central events for the first few years until they finally just absorbed them, put them under contract as teachers, uh, starting in 1910. And we will speed this up. That's the first class picture we have. Uh, we're diligently searching for a class of 1908 picture. We haven't found one yet. That was from the, obviously from the Times. Uh, our sudden success in athletics had made us enemies. Uh, about, first of all, I've, I've mentioned that we made the domestic science. We also built the gym in 1909, uh, and the manual arts building was opened up. Uh, what really turned the screws was the next year we beat City 16 to 3, and, and the score was not indicative of the game. It, uh, it was described in the paper as a brutal beating, and the crowd apparently started taunting the city students. During the game, God, can you imagine? I was only eight kids taunting in the city that had beaten them by 63 points two years ago and taunted us. Uh, that caused the city principal to keep Central from the blocking them from being a member of the prep league. We couldn't play any local team anymore because the city high principal had had it with us. And uh, so the basketball team had to find somebody to play. The gym opened in January of 1910, and we had to play Troop B of Fort Oldthorpe. And that's the kind of teams we played. They played YMCA troop teams and whoever had it wanted to play them in basketball, but they were undefeated. And so they went on a, they actually went on a tour, just took the month of March and went to Knoxville, Asheville, trying to play teams that would play them. And that's how good they were. Uh, they graduated 38, and at that year, the building that we know, the cafeteria and the area above that was only on behind the school uh, and raised the, uh, the capacity of 500 in the fall of 1910. Now, none of this is in the day. Again, we don't have any digest or championships. So no, this has all had to come from the papers and, 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 and notes we found in the library. And that's a picture of when the uh, manual arts and gym was first added in 1990. That's the first big edition, and that's the rear view of it. You can barely see the new back edition on the main building right above it on the left. The one in the girls' gym is. We'll get to that shortly. Uh, the first football, the football teams of 1910 and 11 had to go out and find opponents, so we ended up playing three colleges 
and one high school that year. And hide the high school for one and two against the college. Uh, the first digest was issued in October the, the 31st on Halloween, for some reason, in 1910. And that was a cooperative effort between the commercial department and Ms. Ham uh, Ms. Uh, Carter's English department. And the basketball and baseball teams also had to find, go all over East Tennessee and Georgia looking for teams to play. Uh, in March, it reached the, it reached the, the peak. Uh, City and Macaulay were complaining that Central was recruiting athletes from other states. And Principal Derek ran, ran an article in the paper that said, so what if a kid from Ohio wants to come to Central to prepare for college and play a little football? Who's it hurting? He just taught him. And that was, that was the beginning of the end. We issued the first yearbook that year in, in uh, 1911, the Sleep.